The jay thrush's song poses dramatically the question of how songbirds acquire their distinctive and characteristic songs. How does a bird come to know such a complex song as this? A man who's thought hard about this question is Peter Marler, who began his scientific career as a botanist rather than as an ornithologist, and first got interested in how birds acquire their songs in a rather unlikely way. I was studying the chemical properties of mud up in the Lake District in England <clears throat> at Esswaite Water. And the woods around Esswaite Water were full of chaffinches. And I had long been interested in bird song and derived a good deal of pleasure from it. And in listening, it seemed to me that I could hear dialects in the songs of the chaffinches there as I moved from one valley to another. The pattern of singing seemed to change rather suddenly over quite short distances. Dialects in birds are like human dialects. While the basic language is the same, variations develop in isolated groups. Here are two dialects of the white-crowned sparrow, a species that Marler studied in California, slowed down to one half speed. The three nearer birds are singing the Sunset Beach dialect. The two other birds in the distance are singing the Berkeley dialect. The dialect differences only show up when the songs are looked at closely. The Sunset Beach dialect in the foreground shows a little triple note about two-thirds through the song while the Berkeley Sparrow's song has a characteristic falling note at the end. The differences between song dialects are consistent and can be quite marked when you know what to listen for. And it seems something of a puzzle to understand how these differences could develop. And I became more and more convinced that there was an element of learning in the development of song. No one had seriously studied the idea that birds could learn their songs. It was commonly thought that songs were inherited. So Marler set out to test his idea by experiment. The purpose of all of these chambers here is, of course, to uh, house the birds, which are the subjects of our experiment. They are soundproof, and this then permits us to rear the birds under conditions where we have complete control over everything that they hear. The birds live quite comfortably inside them. Each one is provided with a microphone and loudspeakers so that we can record all of the sounds that the birds make and also play recordings into it. Marler raised newly hatched birds, each from a particular dialect group, this is the Berkeley dialect, in isolation in soundproof chambers. The first group of birds, growing up without hearing any adult song at all, sang when they were adults a strange, greatly oversimplified version of the normal song, heard here at half speed. Did they need to hear an adult song when growing up before they could sing it properly? A second group of birds were played adult song with the dialect of the group they came from. In this case, the Berkeley dialect. When they became adults, they reproduced it perfectly. So hearing adult song was important, but would hearing any song do? Marler played a third group of birds the songs of a song sparrow. because they'd certainly hear this song when growing up in the wild. His birds ignored it, singing when grown up a song as poor as the birds raised without hearing any adult song at all. So birds will pick up their own dialect, but ignore the songs of other species, which leaves the key question, will they copy other dialects of their own species? This is the Sunset Beach dialect, played to a Berkeley bird.
and indeed, even if it wasn't from the area they'd been born in, as long as the adult song was the right species, the birds copied the dialect. They were learning it. While doing these experiments, Marler found that the bird has to hear the adult song during a critical period, before it's seven weeks old. Then there's a long interval till the next spring before the bird starts to sing. And when it does start, it needs a bit of practice. A week or two of groping for the song before it gets it right, like a child's babbling before it learns to speak. Being able to hear is clearly important for the very young bird in picking up the adult song. There are two kinds of roles that the bird's ability to hear play in song development. First, there's the role that we've demonstrated in this case. The bird must be able to hear the songs of adults if it's to copy them and to incorporate them into its own singing. There's also the possibility of a more subtle role that hearing can play in permitting the young male to hear the sound of his own voice. To find out whether a young male songbird does need to hear itself to develop a proper song, some laboratory birds were deafened by Mark Kanishi, at the time a student of Marler's, to block the sound of their own voice. The songs of the deaf bird were even more abnormal than the songs of uh, the isolate. And this comparison led me to uh, speculate about the mechanism of song learning in the white crown sparrow. Kanishi's idea was that every songbird is born with a crude template of its song already in its brain. This hypothetical template needs to be sharpened up by the bird hearing the sound of the adult song during the critical period. The refined template, now reshaped by the adult song, is stored in the brain. And later, when the bird starts to practice its own song as a young adult, he constantly compares it with the template until he gets it right. This template guides the song development. The bird must refer to the template in order to reproduce the model song. The template hypothesis explains the deafening experiments because the deaf songbird cannot refer to the model song. It also helps interpret Marler's earlier studies with the isolated birds. The template allows through any dialect of the right species song, but it excludes the songs of other species. Kanishi's experiments also showed that deafening adult birds after they've learned their song has no effect on the way they sing. Could it be that there's some other feedback pathway besides the one through the ear? Another of Marler's students at the time, Dr. Fernando Nadebaum, decided to find out. Well, Mark Anishi and I were finishing our doctoral work at the same time in Berkeley. His results had shown that auditory feedback was very important, very important for song learning. Nadebaum's experiments were aimed at finding if the nerves between the bird's brain and its vocal cords called the syrinx, could provide such a feedback pathway. While not much is known about the nervous control of birdsong, two nerves are certainly involved, one on the left side and one on the right side. This is the song of a chaffinch at half speed. When not a bomb cut the nerve on the left side, it sang a song like this. When he sectioned the nerve of another bird on the right side, the song sounded like this. Sectioning the nerve reaching the syrinx on the right side had little or no effect on song. The same operation on the left side had a drastic effect on song. I had found then a clear-cut example of neural lateralization. This discovery of neural lateralization, that one side of the brain is more important in the control of song than the other, came as an accident while searching for the feedback, and as a complete surprise. There was another surprise in store. In the chaffinch, the left side of the brain is dominant in the control of song. But when Nottebaum did the same experiment before the bird started to learn its song, the right side of the brain took over, 
and the bird sang a full, normal song. It is at this point that it is worthwhile to raise a question whether birds might not provide a model of vocal development that will allow us to ask and answer questions that are of basic importance to our understanding of speech learning and control in man. It might seem a big leap from bird song to human speech, but there are some striking parallels. The need to hear and mimic adults, a babbling stage, and most of all, Dr. Nottbaum's discovery that one side of the brain seems more important than the other in controlling song, a situation exactly paralleled in human speech. While scientists who study bird song keep these thoughts in mind, they're motivated more by a love of birds and of the songs they sing. The bird song business may shed some unexpected light on how humans acquire speech, but it is certain that understanding a little of how and why birds sing adds a new dimension to the pleasures of simply listening. Have you ever met G.K. Chesterton's Father Brown? Well, you're in for a great treat, as mystery brings you the first of four of these classic tales featuring a priest with an unquenchable talent for sleuthing. Stay tuned to 11 for The Three Tools of Death.